<laughs> if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. These words are often attributed to Leela Watson, who has said of this quote, she is not comfortable with being credited for something that was born of a collective process and prefers that it be credited to aboriginal activist groups from Queensland in the 1970s. 11 years, that is how long we have been told we have by scientists before the damage and the cycle that we are in will reach a point of no return. Certainly at least no return for the possibility of our species to be able to continue as we have. Eleven years we have to reduce emissions in order to stay below a global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Eleven years in that time a human can successfully become a tween. It is the life expectancy for a perch, and sadly, one year past the life expectancy for a goat. In 11 years, we could, in theory, elect three different presidents, 11 new congressional configurations, and at least one new governor in New Jersey. In 11 years, we would have passed 10 federal budgets. It's three years less than it took us to get to the moon, and it's a very good age for cheese. <laughs> in 11 years, we would have made 11 revolutions around the sun. In fact, it takes 365.25 days to do so. Thank you, Leap Year, for making the math work. Of course, the question of 11 years and the press we feel at this moment is not about any of these things exactly. It's not even about whether or not we have the adequate science to deal with the problem. Rather, in the words of Antonio Gramsci, we find ourselves in a time where the old way is dying and the new is struggling to be born. The question is not what can we do in 11 years. The science is abundantly clear and specifically hopeful. Rather, the question is who we can become together as a species in 11 years. Greta Thunberg began by studying the climate crisis at age eight. By 11, the Swedish-born child fell into a deep depression. She would later be diagnosed with autism, which she understands not as a deficit, but quote, as her superpower. She began to commit first to making the changes she could in her own life. Her family, for example, became vegans. They altered their methods of transportation, and her mother, an acclaimed opera singer, retired from her career because she refused to continue her travel schedule, which demanded she board many planes. By the age of 15, Greta had begun her first strike. At first, sitting alone in front of Parliament with a sign. And just one year later, at 16, she was calling for a global climate strike. And this Friday, we, along with hundreds of thousands, will answer the call of this leading climate activist. Eleven years, you see, can see the rise of leaders for a movement. Eleven years can pass in a flash, raging fires, superstorms, rising waters, drought. Policymakers and major fossil fuel producers have known concretely since 1977 that fossil fuel em emissions were causing alarming changes to the nature of the world in which we are living. In fact, the first study was bought and paid for by Exxon. By 1988, Congress began holding hearings in which scientists would warn of the perils of economies and countries dependent on fossil fuels. And yet, the United States would remain to this day the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. 42 years have passed since the initial 
flares were sent into public spaces declaring the climate crisis. But as Greta Thunberg notes, paradoxically and strangely in the United States, it still remains a question for some of whether to believe in this crisis that is all around us. As if we are debating an existential question or the existence of a deity or an afterlife, rather than the cumulative research of thousands of scientists from around the globe. Whereas once we cease to act because of a lack of information, and at times a fear of loss of money, or because of massive campaigns by companies that now own our politicians, now I believe much of our inaction is of a different quality entirely. We once feared what could or could not done, but now we know it can be done. The question is, can we do it? Do we have the ability as a species to move this collectively, to sacrifice for more than the survival of our particular tribe? I believe we will need to see our liberation, our lives as interdependent in order to make the leap. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up in mind, then let us get to work together. Put another way, the lives of my children depend upon our collective ability to abandon despair, to overcome fear, and to act in a way as a species that will be no less than an evolution surpassing the invention of the wheel. My children's lives, 11 years from now, when they are 16 and 12, depend upon the abandonment of despair and the collective sourcing of hope in action, a movement toward the earth that the science already tells us is possible. <coughs> We need hope, not optimism, but a deep-seated hope, the kind of hope that allows you to dissolve yourself into a collective movement. What does hope look like in the present crisis? Hope looks like the awareness that there are those whose teachings and whose entire culture is not based in the same resource extrapolation for the collection of capital that ours is grounded in but instead tells a story that says time is not linear, where strength is not an individual feat, and where the local can be a scale of the global. Adrian Marie Brown, movement thought leader and activist, calls this teaching fractal, that the local is actually a source, a seed for global. Consider Brazil, where indigenous leaders are rising up even as the Amazon burns to resist Bolsonaro and all of the destruction he represents. Consider the Uru Awawa, whose tribe now numbers 120, and yet who are defending the Amazon, who rise every morning, placing tribal paint on their bodies and walking through the forest, and who, without the weapons of industry, are fighting for their right to exist. Hope is in the collectives that are rising. Last week I listened into a call for the Sunrise Movement with young leaders across the country, as young as 12, who are taking up the climate crisis and who are leading, leading us like Greta is, sailing across the ocean, leading us as a generation who does not want our false praise or pats to the head, but who are demanding our attention and who are not waiting for our agreement to move. I find hope in the new strategies that stop us from looking for a hero to take us out of the fires and the floods, but instead emphasize our interdependence and move us toward that collective action. Adrian Marie Brown recently pointed to the colonies of ants in floods. Perhaps some of you have seen this. Ironically enough, fire ants are the best at this collective action in a flood. So rather than piling themselves on top of each other and drowning the bottom of a pyramid so that a few at the top can survive, 
fire ants link one to the other and float like a raft. And they're able to moderate the energy used by each of the ants so that together they can float like this for weeks until they reach dry land. With growing tribalism and the rise of refugee populations directly tied to the climate crisis we face as more places become uninhabitable, there is hope that rather than climbing to the top and drowning one another or waging wars against each other, we can take hold and form a raft. This past week was 18 years since September 11th. I remember where I was on that day very distinctly, as I'm sure many of you do. I was a senior in high school at the time, and now some people are feeling a certain age. <laughs> 18 years, 11 years, the time is quick. I, ironically enough, was just coming out of my government class, headed to biology, when we got into the hall and we could hear people talking see that the teachers were talking to one another and they looked distressed. By the time I got to biology class, the principal had come over the speaker and instructed all of the teachers to hold the students until further notice in the class in which they were in. My biology teacher then said, they're old enough to know. And he turned on the TV. I found myself standing beside a childhood friend all the way from kindergarten. She and I had had a falling out when we started seventh grade, and we hadn't spoken in five years, but we ended up in the same senior biology class together, standing beside one another, trying to make sense of the images we were seeing. Wow, we gasped. Someone in the class, I think it was my friend, said, that tower is going to collapse. And then we all watched together as just that happened. I remember watching as each of us took each other's hands without words. We didn't know all that was going to follow that we would be the generation of the Iraq War, or we had already become the generation of Columbine. Some of my friends would enlist in the military and would be killed in places that I had not even heard of before September 11. Others would chain themselves to university buildings and other public institutions in protest of the war. Yet others would never go to school, but instead would travel to Mississippi for Katrina relief. We became this generation of violence alongside connectivity of Facebook and cell phones and social media, just as mass shootings were on the rise. It seemed all at once the world was expanding and shrinking like the cosmos herself. We are the story, I realize now, in reflection of every generation of people who have ever lived, loved, and died. Of the struggle of war and violence alongside the prophecy and vision of who we yet could be as a species together. And in that strangeness, as I look 11 years before us, I remember and know in the words of my colleague, Reverend Teresa Inesoto, the world is on fire, but not all is lost. I find my salvation, and I use that word in the fullness of healing, I find my salve in actions that move me and us toward connection, toward interdependence, 
toward the leap to each other. The actions that grow the self within me that was not born, chained, or maimed, or colonized. It's in those places I find liberation and healing. We take hands now across these chasms because, frankly, despair is not a luxury afforded in 11 years. Hope's time clock is ticking. On Friday, I will strike. There comes a time in the evolution of people across generations and any mass movement when what Dr. Barber would call a transformational spectacle is required. It's a way of telling our bodies to move toward the future that is our right. It is a way of flexing the muscles of movement to tell those in power that we are to be reckoned with and perhaps most importantly, it is a way to move toward collective rising, toward interdependence, that is our only future, if we are to have one. I strike for my daughter, who this day still has a field she can run in, and I pray that my son will as well. I strike for my son, who builds a world in Minecraft and looks at our world with a vision not yet scarred by violence. I strike with my youngest, 15 months, who has asthma and whose very breath depends upon what we do as a species. I strike with a generation emerging who calls us to an activated hope, a shared commitment. I strike with children under the same sun, but of different tribes whose homes have been swept away, blown away, burned up. We strike together. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up in mind, then let us work together. We strike together because we can do this. If the Uru Awawa can rise, beloved, so can we. If Greta Thunberg can rise, so can we. If ants in the flood can rise, so can we. If Martin could rise, so can we. If Caesar could rise, so can we. If William can rise, so can we. If Nina could rise, so can we. If Angela could rise, so can we. If Ruth can rise, so can we. If Dorothy could rise, so can we. If Rosa could rise, so can we. And if Maya can rise, rise, so can.